going. Okay, so this is recording, so people who couldn't make it can watch it. Now, um, I think we're getting ready to paint. So let me just show you, like I said, this is the image that we're gonna be doing right here. And um, there's, it just so happens with food that there are some colors that I really like. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to my other camera and show them to you and then we will get started. By the way, if anybody, uh, if, if anything goes wrong technically, please drop a note into chat and tell me or even just unmute yourself and tell me if, uh, in case I don't see it in the chat, but I am kind of keeping an eye on the chat. Okay, so one color I really love for food is buff titanium. If you don't have it, uh, Naples yellow can also be nice. And if you don't have that, you might have uh, a white watercolor or a white gouache. And these just help with some of the creamy and pastel sort of uh, colors that could come up in food. So those are some ones that I'm gonna be using that are a little bit outside of what I normally have on my palette, although they're very nice to have on a palette. So I'm also, I wasn't quite sure what brushes I was going to use, so I just have a couple of filberts and a couple of round brushes and a couple of these travel brushes which have a nice fine tip. And then I might at the end use a little bit of white paint pen. I know this is going a little bit in and out of focus, but uh, don't worry about that. Uh, Leslie is asking, could I write the name of the three colors? Yeah, and you should be able to see it in the um, closed captioning that's on as well, but let me just real quick type. Buff titanium, maples yellow, and then white gouache or watercolor. Um, okay, so this is what we're going to do. Those are the tools we have. I am going to start out. Sorry, I'm sort of uh, uh, kind of working backwards here. It's just a funny thing about how it shows up on the video. I'm just trying to make sure I get something that's really within view. So I'm not too worried about getting a, a exactly proportionally correct rectangle there. But what I'm going to do with the drawing is I'm going to be looking at where do these things come in around the edge. So that's where I start and that's how I get things placed is by looking at where they are relative to the edge. And I'm always imagining in my head where the center lines are, even though I didn't grid this. I hope that makes sense. Um, somebody's saying no closed captioning. It's um, it should be along the bottom of your toolbar. You might have to turn it on. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you're able to see that. It's something that I think you have to turn on yourself if you want to see it. All right. So I'm going to start off, and I'm going to draw this plate. And I'm sort of measuring the angles by doing this and just kind of measuring it with my pen and holding it up to the image that I have. And I'm not honestly so terribly concerned about making everything perfect here. You know, the idea is to just sort of have fun with this and play around with it and um, just have the experience of drawing from life. I, um, I, when I teach a class on this, I talk about that I want it to be, I want this to be something that, uh, that you can do while you're eating, you know, that you could actually sit in a cafe and do this before the coffee gets cold. That's sort of always my idea. Somebody's asking what's a good size rectangle for a beginner and, um, Mine is about a five by seven, if that if that helps. But uh, but again, we don't have to be too terribly precise with this. I think I need to make my plate a little bit bigger. I'm doing pretty dark pencil lines, so you can really see what I'm doing. I might normally sketch it a little bit lighter. 
And I'm not too worried about the fact that I'm adjusting and erasing here. This is the point of a pencil. Like there would be no point to having a pencil if you didn't also have an eraser and use it. So, so that's, uh, I'm very much in favor of doing a lot of erasing. So now I'm just going to see if I can get in this little creamer. Now, one thing about drawing little shapes like this that might be sitting on a table that's helpful is that the vertical lines are always vertical, right? So it's sort of reassuring, like, okay, at least that's straight up and down. That helps. So this is just kind of, I'm trying to work out these basic basic, pers basic perspective right here. Not too different from drawing a building, right? Drawing this little box. And I think I'll go ahead and draw these little packets. Again, they don't have to be perfect and they get cut off at the top. I guess I need to make that the top of my image because they get cut off there. And I'm not worried about exactly reproducing what I've, uh, what's in front of me, it's okay. Uh, it's okay if they're a little odd or a little different, but you know, I sort of get from this, I get the idea of this as a thing of sugar packets. That's close enough. Now, for the coffee cup, I'm doing the same thing where I'm just trying to figure out well, where do things connect? Like there's a corner of the coffee cup right there. So that helps. And then the other corner of the coffee cup is down here somewhere. Is it kind of like that? See, I'm not sure. I'm sort of noodling around and figuring it out. Like how wide is this? How wide is it really? And I'm looking at this negative space, like I'm looking at this, does this little shape seem about right? Seems pretty close. I think maybe, maybe it's more like this. This is very much the process I would go through. If I was just sitting in a coffee shop doing this, you know, this is what I'd be doing. And of course, I'd be trying to get my coffee cup sketched quickly so that I can start picking it up and drinking out of it. <laughs> it's always kind of the first priority. Like, let me see if I can get this down so that then I can have a drink. I think it's somewhere in there. That's close. And then the coffee itself sits right there. So uh, I like to get the dishes in first and then put the food on the dishes. See if I can make this a little bit. All right, so I'm, I've gotten that far and um, now I'm gonna try to put this piece of pie on the plate. And I wanna show you one thing about drawing food. This is something um, I do, I do a lot in my, my big class on food, but um, I'll just explain the concept to you. Like, here's a piece of pie. Well, the piece of pie, this is basically a rectangle, the side of the pie. I know it's a little bit curvy because uh, the plate's curvy and because it's pie, but basically we got a line here, a line here, a line connecting it there, and a line connecting it there. And that's the side of the pie. And then we've got this triangle shape that sits on top. So it's kind of about, for me, it's kind of about understanding the underlying geometry of it, if that makes sense. So again, I'm going to start, I want to start by connecting up with a thing I've already drawn. So I'm starting on this edge right here because it connects with the plate. And I know that I've got the plate in the right place, or at least <laughs> close enough to the right place. I've decided that it's good enough. And uh, it's a vertical line and vertical lines are pretty much always going to be vertical. And it comes over to how far now here's another interesting thing like how far over does the pie come relative to the coffee cup 
like the end of the pie just about lines up with where the coffee sits inside the cup. So that's interesting. Like that's sort of helpful. That helps me position it. So like that's kind of the side of the pie. And now the corner of the pie leaves the plate right at about here, right? And so I'm looking at like, where is this relative to say the sugar packets? So I'm always trying to like find a way to connect one shape to another in a way that just sort of makes sense. I think that's about right. It comes up like this and then it just goes like that. Ta-da, now we, now we have the pie. Um, and there's a crust and I really want to draw the crust. The crust is super important to distinguish. And I'm going to exaggerate the amount of crust that you can see. In reality, the cherries are sort of covering up the crust here, but I want to really be able to see some crust on this pie or cheesecake. It's not really pie, is it? It's like a cheesecake with, well, you know what it is. Okay. So we've pretty much got the plate drawn. The only other thing that I might do is there's a little indentation. You can barely see it, but you know, plates often have a rim, right? So I think I'm just gonna very lightly suggest the rim. And then now I'll spend a few minutes just um, cleaning up. I'm gonna let a lot of pencil lines show through. The thing I love about letting pencil lines show is it's like it shows the history of the drawing, right? It's like I was here, I did this sketch, and then I did this painting on top of it. And it's like, it's your hand. It shows the artist's hand at work. So I don't feel the need to cover up the pencil too much or to lighten it. But if you, if that's just not your style and you just don't like the way this looks, then you can lighten it up a lot by just, you know, if you have one of these kind of kneadable erasers or you can erase it way back. I'm just not going to, but feel free to erase it way back if, uh, if you don't like the look of these pencil lines. I'm just cleaning them up where, uh, you know, like I don't want the lines of the plate showing up on the pie, stuff like that. Okay, well, um, without further ado, I guess we should get to painting this thing. Now I'm gonna leave the background. So I'm not gonna worry about the brown of the table right now, because who knows if we'll even have time to get to that. And it would actually be fine to not paint that and just paint everything else. Um, the dishes are all white, which really means a bunch of different colors of gray and cream and off white. So I'm not gonna worry about that right away either. I'm gonna do that towards the end. What I do wanna do first is the crust. So I'm gonna use some Naples yellow. I'll just show you, this is my watercolor kit. It's my travel kit. I use it whether I'm traveling or at home because I want it to be comfortable for me to paint when I'm traveling. So I wanna use the same kit whether I'm traveling or at home. So that's what it looks like. But I'm gonna mix up some Naples yellow with a little bit of maybe yellow ochre to get a golden yellow color. If you don't have yellow ochre, you might have raw sienna, um, even a brown or like a transparent earth that you could dip just a tiny bit into. But this is just like the tiniest bit of transparent red earth and some yellow ochre and some um, Naples yellow. And that's a beautiful creamy texture. So I'll start there. It's kind of dark, but of course it's going to get lighter as it dries. And I really want this crust to show. I don't want to lose that. And it's so easy with watercolor to kind of lose some little detail, but I just think that's so important for making pie look like pie. So, um, I want to do the cheesecake layer next. 
which is one of the things I, reasons I love buff titanium. It's very, very light, but if you don't have that, you're just gonna want the lightest possible wash of say that crust color we just used, maybe mix a little yellow with it. I'm gonna mix a little yellow with this. I think that it's kind of like, I'll show you. I think it's kind of like buff titanium, but maybe there's also, maybe it's a lemon cheesecake. Maybe there's a tiny bit of yellow. I'm not really sure. I just need a creamy, I just need a light creamy color. Now I didn't really draw the berries at all. I'm, I wasn't sure if I needed to, so I decided to just leave it. But you can always come back and add detail with pencil at any time. I'm just leaving some space where I know that the uh, berries kind of come down off the cheesecake. It had not occurred to me that this was going to make me so hungry and it's like right before dinner time here on the on the west coast. A little bit on top, not much. This could certainly be lighter, um, but I think it'll actually look lighter once everything else is in there and plus once it's dry. So that's all I'm gonna do for the cheesecake layer. And I think I'm gonna hold off getting into the berries until everything's dry. So while I'm just looking around, this is always the thing with whatever you're painting, but especially when, um, especially when you're painting from life, if you're sitting in a coffee shop or something, you got to sort of figure out like, well, that's drying, what can I do next? So I'm going to head over to the coffee. So this could be, you could mix up like a burnt sienna or a burnt umber. What I've got is transparent red earth and a little bit of Daniel Smith neutral tint, which darkens it up and makes it a darker brown. Now there is a reflection on this coffee, but you know, I'm really just trying to capture the spirit of this little scene. We don't have to get too terribly fancy. I do like there's kind of a reddish glow around the edge of the coffee that I think is kind of beautiful. And then there's this lighter area where there's a reflection. And I'm just going to work some plain water in and see if that, I mean, I like that actually. So I should have mentioned this earlier, but sometimes you'll get these random little white areas where the paint just didn't quite hit. And I like to leave those, uh, those little, some painters call them sparkles. Um, I like to leave them wherever they end up. And uh, I can always cover them up later if I don't like them, but it's kind of nice to have. So while those things are drying, I might as well go do something about these sugar packets. And you know, the funny thing, I'm not sure where this picture was taken, but sugar packets are such a distinctive set of colors usually. You know, there's the yellow one, there's the light blue one, and there's the pink one. So you can make these whatever color you want. You don't have to copy exactly what you see here. This is, I'm using Hansa yellow. You might have Azo yellow or just whatever. And uh, I definitely want to do the pink, the little pink sweet and low. Uh, there, there isn't a pink packet here, but I just want there to be one. <laughs> so what I'm going to try, I'll put my palette here so you can see. I'm going to take some, I have quinacrinone rose. And I also just have a red and I'm going to try mixing them with this buff titanium that I already put down and see if I get a light creamy pink that reminds me of like sweet and low pink. It's not perfect. It actually looks a little bit more like Pepto-Bismol pink, which maybe is also a good color to put on a, a table at a diner. I don't know, <laughs> but I'm just going to drop a couple of those in and, um, and then maybe I'll do a blue one as well. There's always a blue packet. This is meant to be kind of loose and lighthearted.
those three packets. All right, and now I feel like the pie has dried enough that I could be brave and get in there and start thinking about these cherries on top. So um, I'm gonna clean off an area on my palette. I'm thinking about alizarin and I have quinacrinone rose and quinacrinone magenta. I could use either one and maybe some red, but then I'm also thinking about mixing in some ultramarine to get almost a purplish tone. I'll just show you. There's a alizarin, which I just think is pretty close to ideal. There's quinacrinone rose, which is also pretty nice. Maybe some red. So now I did not draw the cherries with pencil, but if you like this look of seeing the pencil lines, you could certainly come in. You can always do more drawing. You don't have to not draw just because you've started painting. So you could come in here if you wanted to I like to do this sometimes with these something like a berry where you you almost can't tell wh where one ends and the other one picks up and so sometimes it helps to have drawn them. It's also helpful with um, with uh, ice cubes and glasses to just sometimes draw the ice cube. <laughs> so sometimes I'll do that. Um, I should have left this. I should have not painted that part to put that cherry in, but it actually won't really matter. Anyway, if you feel like drawing these in, you certainly can, but you don't have to. Now, I'm going to be putting highlights on these cherries with a white paint pen. If you don't have a white paint pen, but you really want those white highlights, then you're just going to have to remember to leave some white paper. And I always forget. I get so caught up in what I'm doing that I forget. So what I would do if I were in your shoes is I would literally, I would draw them like that. <laughs> I would actually draw where the highlights go. Now you will totally be able to see that in the finished, um, in the finished painting, but, but again, it's okay. Like that's the hand of the artist at work. So I would not worry about that. All right, I've got a alizarin. I wanna darken it up. Maybe with some ultramarine. I don't want to push it too purple, but I do want something that's just darker. So that pushes it more towards a wine color. And I also have Daniel Smith's neutral tint, which is like a thing that makes something uh, black without changing the color temperature too much. So that is probably pretty close to right for the very darkest areas of this. And I also want this mixture to be really thick. So I'm going to try coming in and doing the darkest, darkest areas, which are sort of in between the cherries. Oh, uh, let's see. Leslie's wanting to see the original photo. Hang on just a second. Um, there's a link in the top of the chat to the original photo if you want to have it up on your screen. And then... Um, there was also a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Leslie's the one who asked the question about the color that turns everything darker. And it's called neutral tint. And Daniel Smith is the paint maker that makes it. Uh, it's not, it's kind of like a black, but it's uh, it's basically just, it will tint any color to its the darkest version of that color without too much changing the color temperature. In other words, it doesn't push it too red or too blue. So I'm trying to come in and really establish these dark, dark areas. Oh, and I'm sorry. Uh, somebody asked about showing the photo again. There's the photo, but hopefully you're able to download the photo and you um, have it in front of you, either print it out or on a screen or on your phone or something like that. So I'm trying to just really lay in the dark, dark, dark areas. 
which seem to me to look like they kind of fall in between the cherries. Maybe a little here. And then let's see, there's one that has slipped down onto the plate. I mean, there's definitely people who would start with the lightest area and work up to the darks, but I just feel like if you really have established the darks, then you kind of know where you need to go. And um, it'll maybe encourage you to have some restraint with the lighter areas because it's so easy, I think, especially with watercolor to go too dark. So now I'm gonna mix some red in, because these are cherries. Uh, so I have pyrrole red, but whatever red you have, I'm just going to try mixing some red in, and this is also a lighter watery mixture. I'm kind of exaggerating the redness a little bit. Um, but I just want this sense of these, that these are individual cherries. And definitely, again, if you have, if you find yourself with lots of little accidental white areas, like little sparkles, leave those, leave them for now. Don't, don't be in a hurry to cover things up right now because a lot of those little white sparkles could end up looking great as highlights, just accidental little highlights. So I hope you guys are having fun. This is definitely meant to be just sort of a relaxed little experiment. Don't take it too seriously. The thing I always tell people about sketchbooks is that, you know, you might look back on your sketchbook and think, oh, that one, I don't like how that one turned out. Oh, this one's, uh, I wasn't really happy with that one. But when you have a whole sketchbook filled with drawings from your trip or just from your everyday life and you just flip through it, it looks wonderful. In other words, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Like it's sort of astonishing how great it all looks together and how when you look back on it later, you don't even really remember which drawings you were not satisfied with. <laughs> You're like, wow, it's so amazing that I have all of this to remember that trip I took or to remember everything we did that summer or just my everyday life back then. So give yourself a little credit and just know that the act of recording all this stuff, it's just worth so much. And it's all going to be way hipper and cooler than you think it is once you can see it as a whole and you can flip through 20 or 30 pages of this stuff. So now I'm using a very watery brush for this kind of glaze or filling that's spilling down the side. <laughs> this is really making me want some pie, some cheesecake. So I left quite a bit of white, and I'm just gonna leave it for now. I'm not gonna decide. I'm not gonna decide what I think about that. Um, I'm really happy with the coffee. I think the sugar packets are basically fine. I could go in and add some little shadows between them. I might do that in a minute. One thing I wanna do though, is I want to take some brown. So if you had like, burnt sienna or transparent red earth or just any kind of brown, maybe a reddish brown. So I'm gonna use my trans, I'm gonna, I'll show you what color I'm using here. I'm gonna use my transparent red oxide. And I just wanna come in and make a, some kinds of little marks in the crust. Don't make them too even. Just try to make them a little bit random, but there's, this is a good crust. There's little holes in it. Um, it's kind of darker along the bottom like it should be. 
I just want a little variety. I'm sort of glad you can see the pencil lines because that also gives it some variety, keeps it from just trying to be too perfect. I don't want to do too much of that or it's going to look like it has the chicken pox, but I think a little bit, a little bit of that is nice. If you think you've gone overboard anywhere, you can always just come in with a damp brush and pick a few of them up. It's no big deal. So I've got a lot of basic colors down and now um, I'm going to look at the plates and how to make them not seem so flat. And I'm going to save the background for last, but I think I will have time to put the background in. So I'm going to get a bigger brush. And we have kind of some browns and grays already mixed up, but I'm going to work on the shadow on the coffee cup first. And I'm going to take, I have this, uh, this is another Daniel Smith color. It's called Shadow Violet. And it's kind of an instant shadow color. It is ever so slightly purple. I'm going to clean out my area where I have my berries here. It's a gray. If you don't have a gray, you can mix a gray by just mixing together some red and blue and yellow. <laughs> It, almost any red and blue and yellow. Browns are good for helping to mix grays. Any mixture of browns and uh, blues will get you a gray. You might have a Payne's gray on your palette or something. But I'm going to take that gray, just a basic gray, and mix some yellow ochre into it to get kind of a neutral color that leans more towards brown because the shadows that we see here are really influenced by this reddish color of the tabletop. So I want this mixture to be very wet so it'll be very light. I know this looks crazy dark. I'm using lots of water, I'm cleaning my brush off. Trying to get that sense of shadow. And it goes up the cup and kind of underneath the rim. And then I can come in with just a very wet brush and kind of knock it back and soften it so it doesn't look like it's a hard line. And you know, I'm just sort of playing around with this. I should tell you that usually I do the, whatever we're gonna paint, I've usually done it two or three times before we get together. And this time I actually decided deliberately not to because I want this to be like the kind of thing that you really would do in a cafe um, on the spot. And you never know what's gonna be set down in front of you in that cafe. So I was like, I'm gonna be surprised. I'm gonna, I mean, I know what the picture is but I'm not gonna practice painting it three times ahead of time because I want to talk about what it's like to just do this in a really free, spontaneous way. There's so many different shadows in the handle. You could almost like do a master class in shadows just on this handle, but I want this to be fast and loose. I mean, I'm going slow. I'm going slow here by the standards of what I would do in a coffee shop so that you guys can go along with me, but these sort of loose brush strokes that don't even quite match up with the pencil line, like that is totally the look for, I sketched this in a coffee shop. <laughs> like that's exactly what I'm going for. So even though I'm going at this kind of leisurely pace, I'm wanting when I actually put the paint down, I'm wanting you to see like, this is the vibe of this thing is quick and fun and not fussed over. This half of the upper rim also, I think it's a little bit more of a bluish shadow. So I'm gonna drop a little bit more blue into this just super light neutral mixture. That may be it. I might come back and do more on the 
on the sugar uh, little packet of the, the little container with the sugar packets, there's kind of a, I can just barely see it, but there's sort of a sharp little line of a shadow there. Again, I want it to be super light, so I'm sort of picking it up with, putting it down with my brush, but picking it up again too. And there's also a rim on it. And so I'm just observing that there's a shadow underneath the rim. It's dark right here on the inside. It's kind of dark right there. These are just little ways to give it some form, some shape without going too crazy with it. Like we're not gonna get, we're not gonna get all academic about that there's a million different ways to paint something that's white. Now the plate, I can see just a little bit of shadow or you know, reflection in this corner. And this is just the difference between the rim and the uh, in, inner part of the plate, whatever that's called. There's probably a term for it. I've been watching the Great British Pottery, the Great Pottery Throwdown, and I'm learning all these special terms for ceramics. I think there is a term for it, but I've forgotten what it is. But anyway, this is almost just dirty water right here. This is like the lightest possible little bit of gray, just to kind of barely suggest that there's a little bit of a shadow there. It's gonna be even lighter when it dries. And I just can't decide. I think maybe there's a tiny little feeling of a shadow over there. Not much. But the pie would have, there, there's just a, the littlest bit of reflection where the pie sits. So this is the tiniest bit of this gold color from the crust. It's such a small amount just to kind of barely suggest that the pie itself casts a little bit of a reflection onto the plate. The rest of it's pretty bright white for the moment. I'm gonna maybe get the tiniest bit of a blue gray, so little in here. Not even everywhere, like it's just barely there. It just sort of barely suggests that, that it's not the bright white of the paper. Um, I'm gonna mess with the pie just a little bit more before we're finished, but I'm actually feeling like I can go ahead and get a background color in. And I'm gonna get a bigger brush out. I'm gonna get a flat brush like this. And I'm just going to mix up a brown. I'll use my transparent earth red, but again, burnt sienna, burnt umber, or just any brown. If your brown doesn't have any red in it, just dip into your red or orange. We just want a color that's like the color of wood. And I'm not going to be too precious about this. I'm just going to lay something down. I'm not even worried about staying within the lines exactly, you know, like around the edge, doesn't matter. You can't really see any wood grain on this table, but if there was a lot of wood grain, I would ignore it because we're not supposed to be, oops, I just messed up my handle of my cup there. We're not supposed to be looking at the wood grain. We're supposed to be looking at the food and the drink. I'm going to see if I can fix this. <laughs> I painted right on top of my little cup handle, and I'm just going to see if I can put some water down and pick it up a little bit. Again, not horribly worried about stuff like that. And of course, I did not dry that enough so it went right back into the handle of the cup. That's great. I'm 
this is the kind of thing I could come in with my white paint pen and reemphasize that white, but you know, I'm honestly, I'm just not concerned. Like this is definitely supposed to feel like it was painted in the moment. So there you go, what do you expect? It would be fine also to just leave the background out and call it done. Especially if you want to write on it, like let's say you're traveling and you want to write yourself some notes about your day or about how much you like the pie. It could be that the background is just going to be you getting out your pen and writing all over this. That would be cool. So don't feel like you always have to color everything in. You know, you really don't. Like even painting like a cityscape or something, you don't have to paint every single building. It might be that you do the yellow taxi cab and the green trees and you just leave the buildings themselves totally unpainted. Like you can just paint part of something and leave the rest of it just drawn and it looks kind of great that way. In fact, I sort of wish I'd taken a picture of this without the background in before I put it in just to remember it by. <laughs> I think this looks pretty good. It's kind of sweet. Now, if this background dries in time, I'm going to put a shadow in under that plate. Hopefully it will, because I think it needs it. So I'm just going to go back and kind of look again at the pie. I want very, very dark colors. The, getting the darks dark enough with watercolor, it's such a great thing to do. If you can just really punch in the darks, then the whole thing just comes to life. Because, you know, watercolor is transparent. It lightens as it dries. So sometimes we just lose the darks and we lose the drama. So I'm just coming back in and I'm covering up some of those little white sparkle, sparkly areas because I think it's so much more important to have really dark, dark areas in here. If you really look at the picture, it's almost black in between some of these cherries. So I know this is going to lighten when it dries, so I can kind of exaggerate some of this. Oh, DL asked what color I'm using right now. It's really that same mixture. It's the Daniel Smith neutral tint and the alizarin crimson and um, a little bit of quinacridone permanent rose. Now I'm just coming in with some alizarin and kind of getting in a bit more of a mid-tone that's just a little darker. Oh, and also the where the sauce is kind of dripping down, that needs some texture to it. That looks a little too smooth to me. So I'm just going to come in and sort of I don't know, darken it up over here. And then with a wet brush, I'll kind of just mush it into the rest of the of what I painted before so it won't have a harsh edge. That's better. It just needed something. It just wasn't quite, wasn't quite right. So this is dry. It feels dry to the touch. It also does not feel cool to the touch. If you're paper still feels cool, then it didn't dry all the way. So I'm going to mix up, I'm just going to take some neutral tint and mix that into this brown, brown mixture I had. Oh boy, that's dark. Let me try with shadow violet. Maybe that's better. I don't want to go too dark with this shadow. I'm just going to take some shadow violet with a little bit of this transparent red mixed in. Hopefully this is transparent enough and I'm just gonna see about laying down a shadow underneath this plate. And then over here too, I can see a shadow. This is definitely the kind of thing where, you know, 
You can leave the background out altogether, like I said. Um, if you do put in a background, then the shadows do sort of help it pop a little bit. I feel like there's kind of a darker, there's a little bit of a shadow underneath the sugar container over there. And then I can't decide, it's not much, but there is a bit of a shadow here. I'm gonna go ahead and go for it. It's very subtle, the shadow cast by the cup. So I wasn't sure if I really wanted to put it in, but I kind of like it. I think it reads as a shadow. I think it sort of makes sense right there. Wow, that's kind of fun. I, I have to tell you, now that we've done it, I almost wish I'd done kind of a really zany, fun color as the background. Like, don't bother with the wood. Like, I sort of wish I'd done a, you know, a checkered tablecloth or some blue and white stripes or just something totally different, or maybe even just left it white. Um, you, you could continue to play around with the background if you wanted. Like, since we have a couple of minutes, I'm just gonna, you know, I could have made it redder. I sort of toned down the redness of it, but maybe it wants to be a little redder in places. It doesn't have to be quite so uniform. At this point, I'm totally just experimenting. I'm just asking myself, like, well, what if I made the wood, what if I made this wood table more of a red tone, at least on one side, maybe? It's kind of interesting. I don't have to do the whole thing. I can just do part of it. Um, so I'm waiting for my cherries to dry and I'm going to use my white paint pen to do a few little highlights. But if anybody has questions, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask a question or just keep on painting. Or you can put a question in the chat if you have one. Leslie asked if I have a favorite brush, regardless of what's in front of me. Well, um, I kind of go through phases. Lately, I've gotten to where I really like these filbert brushes, especially for landscapes and more uh, people and more natural organic forms. That rounded brush is so nice. But, you know, honestly, I use this a ton when I'm traveling. Like this is such a good brush for a really sharp little tip, but also you can cover a fair amount of ground with it, surprisingly. But I've just, I've gotten to where I'm, I'm one of these people who has way too many brushes. So like I have a jar that's got, <laughs> that's got everything in it. And um, when I'm traveling, I have to be disciplined and only take a few things. But when I'm at home, what's the white tool I'm using now? So this is the paint pen. So this is a Uni Posca acrylic paint pen. And I love these pens. Uh, I have a bunch of different sizes of them in white, but also in cream. There's an ivory color. And sometimes like out in nature, the ivory color makes a little more sense. The white is a little too white. But they're great for adding little reflections and highlights on, on water. So like oceans and rivers, but also this kind of thing where you maybe just want a little bit more of a, of a bright white on a piece of food or the glint in someone's eye, like whether you're doing animals or people, sometimes you really want to catch that highlight in their eye. I'm gonna see what happens if I go over this part of the cup that I painted over. That's not too noticeable. It does not look too much like a correction. <laughs> I mean, this was not meant to be like hyper realistic, super perfect. It's definitely, it's definitely obvious that the paint kind of went all over the place. But um, I'm pretty happy with how the how the cup turned out. That there's little bits of reflections on it, but it's obviously a white cup. And same here. And I think the plate, as it's dried, has turned out pretty good as well in that sense. Um, if I was going to do anything else, since we have a few more minutes, 
I would just get some little darker, deeper, intenser colors down in the sugar packets, like I'm bringing some yellow ochre into that yellow. And I might see about a darker, more intense red kind of down here in the bottom of the pink packets, just to suggest like little shadowy areas. I don't know, it's not totally necessary. It's not at all necessary, but 